The following is a recording of a live questions and answers session with Chris McCann that took place on Sunday, September 8th, 2019. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to eBible Fellowship Sunday question and answer program. During this time, we're going to open up the phone lines to take your call, and each person is invited to call and share what's ever on your mind by dialing the number that was just mentioned. And I'll try to respond as much as possible by turning to the Bible, which is God's holy word. And there we find answers to our questions according to the perfect will of God. Okay, we're going to get started and begin by going to the first person on the phone today. Welcome to our program, please. Go ahead with your call. Yes, hi. The resurrection of the dead, the just and the unjust. Now, the unsaved, obviously, they're not going to enter into heaven. Are they going to have eyes be opened and conscious existence to stand and be arraigned like, a, like in a real court? Or, or it'll just be a spiritual thing where the graves will be tossed open and the, their bones will be displayed as an open chain? Yeah, well, no, they, they're not going to have conscious existence as far as those that have already physically died. That's not possible because when they died, they died. You, you know, when, when we think about the historical or traditional understanding of the resurrection of the dead, it really is strange. It really is strange to think that God will reanimate, give life, to those that have died and bring back their body. And the idea was whether, you know, they died in the ocean in a shipping accident and were eaten by fish, that, that God's going to reform the body, reform a breath of life, right? That's what we mean by conscious existence, that God would somehow breathe life back into them again. What for? Well, so they could stand for judgment to, to be judged. And you see, that idea only goes along with eternal damnation, with the incorrect understanding and doctrine that, that you need someone to be conscious, to have conscious existence, so that they can be aware of their suffering forever and ever and ever and ever and ever. That's the only reason that there would be a need for conscious existence. And God corrected us concerning the understanding of hell, and he's corrected us concerning the understanding of his judgment in many ways. And what's going to happen, and we do read in John chapter 5, it says in verse 28, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. The word resurrection simply means to rise. And so the elect who have physically died will be resurrected as their body is translated and changed into a spiritual body, they'll rise up to be with the Lord. The, and, and that's the resurrection of the just. Those that have died, you, they, you see, they're already dead in soul. Then when they died in body, they lost the breath of life. And that's why the Bible says they die like beasts, just like the dogs and cats and birds and fish or all creatures that had the breath of life, God gave a spirit in a sense that was not a soul, as in the soul that, that died that man had, but, but just to make the body live, there, there was this, this mind and, and essence of a person, and that, in the day they died, is gone. It's gone. It, it ceases to exist, and, and so on the last day, their physical remains will be brought up out of the ground, and, and God will 
uh, I don't know what he's going to do for he'll raise up ashes or raise their dead bones. He's not going to reform them into the body. It, it's just that whatever left of them will come up out of the ground. But that's the understanding that fits and harmonizes with everything else the Bible says. Thank you for calling and sharing. And let's go to the next person on the phone today. Welcome to our program, please. Go ahead with your call. Yeah, Chris. Uh, good study this morning. Really on time. Uh, looking for Christ, being patient. In Revelation chapter 15, verse 3. Could you read that, please? Revelation 15, 3. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. Okay, now, this is during our time right now. Is that not true? And how uh, do the two songs, the song of Moses and the song of the Lamb, uh, fit together. They're both saying the same thing. And and what is that? Could you explain yeah. this verse? Please? Go ahead. Yeah, that's a good question. And um, when we we look at what the Bible says uh, about the Song of Moses, uh, for example, I think it's in Deuteronomy 31. It says in um, verse 19. Now therefore write ye this song for you, and teach it the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. For when I shall have brought them into the land, which I swear unto their fathers, that floweth with milk and honey, and, and, and so forth. And then verse 22, Moses therefore wrote this song the same day and taught it the children of Israel. And he gave Joshua the son of Nun a charge and said, Be strong. And of good courage, for thou shalt bring the children of Israel into the land, which I swear unto them, and I will be with thee. And the song, uh, I'm, I'm not doing a good job, I'm looking for a particular verse that mentions that really the song of Moses focuses on the judgment of the house of God or, or uh, on the people Israel, which would in turn point to the, the judgment on the corporate church. And I think the song, uh, yeah, in verse 30 of Deuteronomy 31, And Moses spake in the ears of all the congregation of Israel the words of this song until they were ended. And then it goes into uh, the next chapter, and it has to do with, with uh, the judgment on his own people. And, and so the the understanding of the Song of Moses as song in the Bible uh, as well as music identifies with the Word of God. And it is the, the teaching of the Bible and the Gospel, we always have to remember, is the truth of the Word of God as taught in its proper time and season. And, and so the teaching of the Gospel at the end of the church age and at the time when God opened the scriptures during the Great Tribulation to bring forth information like the, uh, the church age was over and it was time for the people of God to get out of the churches and congregations, that's the Song of Moses. The focus is on the judgment of uh, the churches and congregations. And uh, here, though, it says they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb. And the song of the Lamb is the song of the people of God, which again is their declaration, the things they, they declare or share as God opens their eyes to truth in the day of judgment. It's interesting how often in the book of Revelation, where Christ is seen as the judge, that he's called the Lamb. For example, in, in Revelation chapter 6, in verse 17, for the great day of his wrath has come, well, I'm sorry, verse 
16 into 17, says, And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who shall be able to stand? There's other references to Judgment Day where the Lord Jesus is described as a lamb as he brings the wrath. And that's the idea here that they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of saints. In other words, as we teach today, that the church age is over, God's judgment is upon them, and that the door is shut and God's judgment is on the world, we're singing the song of Moses on the one hand and the song of the Lamb on the other. Each song is pointing to the particular focus of the judgment of God in his end-time judgment program. And then it goes on to say here in verse 5, in Revelation 15, and after that I looked, and behold, the temple of the tabernacle of the testimony in heaven was open, and the seven angels, or the seven messengers, came out of the temple having the seven plagues clothed in pure and white linen and having their breasts girded with golden girdles. And uh, this uh, absolutely confirms the seven angels are God's elect. They're the saints. Because angelic beings, spirit beings, uh, who did not fall, that's how they remained in heaven. Uh, Satan and his, his forces fell into sin, but those that remain did not fall and therefore had no need of a covering over sin. But these angels are said to be clothed in pure and white linen. Well, read Revelation 19.8, and it says the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. It's the covering Christ gives his people. So there, there is zero question about the identity of the seven angels here. They are the saints. They're the elect children of God. And they have their breasts girded with golden girdles. And that is clothing that identifies with priests because they're going to perform a priestly duty in, in the sense that God will, will have them carry this message that the Word of God is revealing uh, at the time of the judgment. And it goes on to say in verse 7 and verse 8, and one of the four beasts, or one of the four living creatures, gave unto the seven angels, messengers, seven golden vials full of the wrath of God, who liveth forever and ever. And the temple was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power. And no man was able to enter into the temple till the seven plagues of the seven angels were fulfilled. And then chapter 16 describes the pouring out of these seven vials full of the seven last plagues, which each of the angels is pouring out. The angels who are clothed with pure and, and uh, fine white linen who are the saints. And that's what the people of God are doing at this time as we share the information we're finding on the pages of the Bible. We're pouring out the vials of the last plagues of God which in turn would identify with the Song of the Lamb. But thank you for calling and bringing up that verse. And now let's go to the next person on the phone. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Uh, yes, concerning um, the Americans, uh, you know, mostly um, have their wedding day planned on um, Saturdays. Uh, a friend, uh, his opinion was um, because, like Americans, you know, a, a lot of Americans are very uh, work-oriented. They take pride in their work. 
and they wanted to uh, celebrate a wedding on Saturday and rest on Sunday, so they'll be well rested for their work in Monday. I just heard you um, mentioned a few minutes ago about maybe from one of your tapes that uh, you were saying uh, people used to uh, have their weddings on Saturdays, but I'm from overseas, and they have always had it on Sundays, but in the latter generations, they started doing their weddings on Saturdays, and I thought that might be from the American influence. And um, there was a message from China questioning about uh, marrying on Sundays that a lot of Chinese, they married on Sundays. But uh, that's my friend's opinion because... Uh, let, let me just interrupt for a second. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's an American influence because the tradition in America is was really a tradition in the West, as far as I know, and it came from the understanding of those who believe the Bible that Sunday was the Lord's Day. Sunday was a day to, you know, during the church age, go to church and to focus on God, to focus on the Word of God, on spiritual things, and and it just simply was not the day for weddings or or uh, for other activities. It, it, it was a day for God. And now that is being lost at the time of the end uh, as, as the world, uh, you know, Sunday's like any other day. And, and so since it's like any other day, they, they've already trampled it underfoot with, uh, you know, everything under the sun from this sport to that sport to the other sport to, uh, to holidays and, 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 uh, everything else, and and so yeah, why not? Why not weddings? Why not uh, whatever? And and so that's the mindset today. There there really is little to no thought given by people that it is the Lord's day, that it is a day God has set apart for worship. And if uh, other nations haven't realized that, well. Probably it would have to do with maybe a lack of influence of Christianity to some degree in other parts of the world. Uh, and, and so maybe different traditions like Buddhist or, or Muslim or whatever, Shintoist or, or whatever religion would not have the same focus or emphasis on Sunday as the Lord's Day. And so, of course, yeah, they're, they're going to have different traditions. But, but where Christianity was, there, you know, throughout the church age, there was an influence that Sunday is the Lord's day and, and not a day for, um, for these other things. Can you please read Luke 11:50 and 51? Luke 11:50 says that the blood of all the prophets, which was shed from the foundation of the world may be required of this generation, from the blood of Abel unto the blood of Zacharias, which perished between the altar and the temple. Verily I say unto you, it shall be required of this generation. Well, we know from scriptures, Deuteronomy 18 and uh, and verse 18 and uh, the fourth gospel chapter 4 19 that Christ was acknowledged as a prophet now we know that people stumble on Christ the stumbling block but John the Baptist and King David knew in their heart that Christ literally preceded them and Christ said before Abraham was I am so also in this case Luke 21, 50, and 51, people tripped. My question is, since Abel to Zacharias 
were all Old Testament or prop, uh, saints or prophets that typified Christ, whose blood was shed. Um, did Christ uh, preclude himself as one of the Old Testament prophets that were slain since the foundation of the world? Did he preclude himself as one of the Old Testament saints? Well, this is actually a, another verse, it's a, another proof text that is confirming that Jesus died and gave his life at the foundation of the world. You, you do not shed blood in, well, it, it says the blood of all the prophets which was shed from the foundation of the world. Okay, now let's ask the question. Did Abel literally shed his blood at the foundation of the world? And the answer is no. Did Zacharias shed any blood at the foundation of the world in a physical sense? And the answer is no. So we have to understand it spiritually, and so we have to look at what words mean. And, and so when we look up blood in the Bible, what does it point to? Leviticus 17. The life is in the blood. The life is in the blood. The blood of all the prophets. Who is the blood of? of all God's elect, and the reference to Abel to Zacharias, conveniently A to Z uh, for us English speakers, is actually a reference from beginning to end, uh, because Abel was the first recorded man we find that was truly saved in history, and Zacharias, well, he wasn't the last, but, but the significant thing about him was when he died, the Bible tells us he was 130. He was 130, which is 10 times 13. 10, completeness, 13, end of the world. And it would be, at the time of the end of the world, just after 13,000 years of history, that God would save the last of his elect. So the figure is, because God wrote the Bible in the first century, he couldn't say from Abel to, um, you know, Carl Smith or Carl Jones, that, that last elect whose name was recorded in the Lamb's Book of Life, who was saved on May 20th, 2011. God couldn't have done that because he was compiling the Bible in the first century. So he used a type and a figure, a man to represent the end, Zacharias, and uh, again, his significant death age of 130. Therefore, God is speaking of the blood of all the elect, of all the prophets, as all the elect are spiritually prophets, priests, and kings, and all the blood of all the elect was shed from the foundation of the world. Now, of course, that immediately draws our attention to Revelation 13a, the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And to be slain means to be killed, and, and Christ is the lamb who was killed. He sacrificed himself, thereby giving his life or shedding his blood, which is the life is in the blood. So the life of all the elect was shed, or he was killed at the foundation of the world. And then we have exactly the point that God is making. It fits in with Hebrews 9, uh, 26. It fits in with Revelation 13, 8 and many other verses, that uh, the, the elect had their blood shed in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ as we were all in him, as he bore our sins and died on our behalf. And so God likened the fact that 
he gave his life as though it, it was ours and and it was applied to us and and that's um, the the wonderful message that's being taught in these verses but thank you for calling and bringing up these scriptures and let's go to the next person on the phone today welcome to our program please go ahead with your call hi Chris in 1st Corinthians 6 1 and 6 2 dare any of you having a matter against another to go to law before the unjust and not before the saints do you not know that the saints shall judge the world and if the world shall be judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the smallest matters? Uh, there's two points I, I want to make. I think God is telling his elect saints, how dare any of you go to the court of law before this unjust world to sue one another? That's like for the world. That's not for the elect. That's, and point number two, the elect saints are judging the world now as they proclaim the truth about May 21, 2011, being Spiritual Judgment Day, at the door to salvation shut. This is judgment to this unsaved world who wants to believe we're still in uh, the day of salvation. And I'll take your response, Chris. Well, yeah, we, we do have to take into account that this is the epistle to the Corinthians, and, and there was a corporate church uh, that was, that was uh, at that time established and, and it was the beginning of the church age. And, and so really Paul's point is you have a dispute, you have a matter against another, and you go to law before the unjust, so they take it to the secular authorities, and not before the saints, rather than taking it to the church authorities who would settle the matter. So, so there is a historical element to what's being said here that would have some application to church authority. But then it goes on to say, as you point out, do you not know the saints shall judge the world? And if the world shall be judged by you, are ye unworthy to judge the smallest matters? So God is saying, look, you, you want to uh, turn this over and, and have the secular judge, and, and uh, he could be an unjust judge, to judge this matter. And yet you and, and the saints of God, if, of course, this would only apply to those that are truly elect, but they were professing to be, so you are going to judge the whole world. And in the world, you'll judge all worldly authority, all worldly institutions. And, of course, at this time, we see that with the judgment of God. It's on all the institutions, in, including the judicial system, which I'm sure will... Uh, be highlighted uh, as far as the injustices, the wrongs that the the judicial system of the world has established in making things such as abortion, uh, which is the murder of innocent children legal, or in uh, making marriage between men and men and women and women legal, which goes contrary to the law of God, the Bible, and many things that, that will, I'm sure before God's done, come to the surface and, and that worldly institution will likewise be exposed and brought to public ridicule and shame as many others have been. And, and so God's plan is to judge the whole world and everything in it, and he is bringing his people along where the saints are with Christ, and as Christ is reigning, as Christ is ruling the world, the saints are ruling with him, we, we could read in a few places, and, and, and so um, it, it really is helpful to each of us 
you know, we we sometimes feel unqualified maybe to make a judgment. And a judgment is a determination. It's making a decision. And and when it comes to the Bible, it's making a determination, now this is right, that or this is true doctrine, and, and this isn't. And God's people are given ears to hear the truth of the Word of God and to make judgments concerning doctrinal matters all the time. All the time. We're we're, you know, in a sea of apostasy and with the church and and outside the church. It's just everywhere. And constantly we're making these kinds of judgments. No, that's not true. That's not faithful. That's false. That's incorrect. And at the same time, God has given us the ability. This is the truth. I've um, seen it. I, I you know, uh, checked it out. Compared scripture with scripture, this rings true. I hear the voice of Christ in these things, and and so that's that's really where the saints' judgment begins is determining the truth of the Word of God, and and as God gives us ears to hear and, and to understand the truth of the Word of God in the day of judgment, then we share it, we proclaim it, and we will be judging the world with him, accompanying the Lord in that sense. And and so it is. It is a a tremendous, major thing that the saints are involved with at this time as as we uh, judge the world with the Lord Jesus. But thank you for bringing up these two verses. And now we'll go to our next caller. Welcome to our question and answer program today. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, hello, Chris. Uh, if you can look at uh, Matthew 24, 20 and read that verse. Okay, Matthew 24, verse 20 says, But pray, pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. And really that would read, neither in Sabbath. Okay, uh, can you explain what that means? Uh, I think I know what winter means, but what does in Sabbath mean? Well, yeah, and, and then it goes along with verse 21, because following in Sabbath, it says, For then shall be great tribulation. So we know winter and Sabbath uh, identifies with great tribulation. And, uh, yes, the, the winter... Uh, can be understood as God uses the word winter sometimes to point to judgment and and to tribulation. And as far as Sabbath, now there is an interesting verse or a couple of verses in Second Chronicles, in Second Chronicles chapter 36, where it says, and and this is at the point when the city of Jerusalem is being destroyed. They burnt the house of God. The Babylonians are destroying the city. And then it says in verse 21 of Second Chronicles 36, to fulfill the word of Jehovah by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths. For as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath, to fulfill three score and ten years. And the three score and ten or seventy years is the historical type of the actual duration for the Great Tribulation. Or it's a it's a figure that God used from 609 BC when King Josiah of Judah died through 539 BC. That 70 year period was a historical parable pointing to the Great Tribulation, which would actually be 23 years, but but the important thing is, as far as your question, as long as she lay desolate, Judah, Jerusalem, the house of God, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So that's telling us that the entire 70 years was fulfilling of Sabbath rest. 
uh, because, well, Judah of old had desecrated the Sabbath as far as uh, what it was teaching, and so God brought judgment upon them to spiritually observe Sabbath. And, and so in Matthew 24, we read reference to this in verse 20, Pray ye your flight be not in the winter, neither in Sabbath. That is, pray that your flight be not in the time of great tribulation. And uh, it's a whole other question about the flight. I think a good picture of that would be in Acts 27 with the ship that is uh, soon to be shipwrecked. And uh, that's a, also a picture of the destruction of the church. And remember, the mariners wanted to flee. They, they wanted to, to leave the prisoners and, and flee and on their lifeboats and get away. And, and Paul told them not to do it, not to do it. They were not to flee. And we wonder why. Because eventually God destroyed the ship and, and forced them to flee. Well, that, that's the point. Uh, that it, it has to do with God's timing. That everything is done in its proper time and season. Uh, and, and so not until God opens the word to reveal the truth that the, the church age is over and then issues forth the command to his people, come out of her or, or depart out of the midst, which would be flee, then that's when it becomes a faithful thing to obey and to do. But until that point, no, it was God's purpose to leave his people within the churches and congregations. But thank you for your question. And we're going to continue now with our question and answer program by going to our next caller. Welcome to our Sunday program. Please go ahead with your call. Mr. McCann, can you read Romans 3, uh, verse 21 and 22? Romans 3, verse 21. But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God, which is by faith of Jesus Christ, unto all and upon all them that believe, for there is no difference. The, the pure gospel of grace you've mentioned before, it, it really w can't be found except by the witness of the Bible, the Law and the Prophets, and it really was not revealed to us until the time, the, the time at, of the end, uh, probably from the time that the two witnesses in Revelation 11 stand again on their feet and we begin the, the last half of the tribulation. I'm wondering if that has a tie-in to the historical parable of the transfiguration because the two witnesses or the two men or Moses and Elijah that appear and speak of his um, and, and deceased is, is more commonly used that number as departing or could be so departing from Jerusalem and if I go to my Revelation 11 it says the two witnesses will be overcome and their dead bodies lay in the street of spiritually Sodom and Egypt, which was where the Lord was crucified. Uh, do you think those three have a tie-in? It would all be now, the kingdom at the end? I want to make sure I understand what you're asking. You're um, making reference to Matthew 17 and other passages, the Mount of Transfiguration, and that Christ meeting with Moses and Elias, or Elijah, is somehow related to Judgment Day? Yes, because in Romans it says that the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. And that happened at the end. The, the only time that we really understood you cannot be saved by any works. And that was again pointed out in Revelation 11 by 
uh, the death of the witness, the the law and the prophets in in the in the church. And then once again, it's outside of the church when the witness of the law and the prophets lives again out, outside the church. And then I've got this passage in Luke 9. Is I, I like Luke 9 because that's the eighth day reference. And in Luke 9, it says, They spake of his uh, deceased to be accomplished in Jerusalem. I don't think it's speaking literally because he's talking to us uh, that are now seeing the kingdom of God at the end. Or have I, you know, I can, you know, I can get myself turned around. Do you know how that goes? <laughs> well, yeah, so, so can I. I think it's uh, not that hard to do. Um, I don't know. Uh, I wouldn't be surprised because it, it does seem like we're led back to the Mount of Transfiguration, you know, as we're, we're following certain teachings that, that God is opening up in his word that we we are led back here fairly often but there's just something that I'm not understanding about it that is it's not opened up to my understanding exactly what's going on so that makes it hard for me to comment on these kinds of things I, I really can't answer um, at this time I think it's probably the best thing for me to say but thank you for calling and sharing and now we'll take the next person on the phone today. Welcome to our question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. It's a good day to hand out tracts on the boardwalk in Ocean City. Uh, my question is, we hear a lot, uh, in, you know, with these recent shootings, mass shootings, that it's a God-given right to protect yourself. Uh, can you comment on that? Well, yeah, you know, uh, the Bible does not tell us to protect ourselves. Actually, uh, the Bible tells us to look to God for strength and help. And, of course, we shouldn't be surprised. The world often thinks things, uh, you know, such as you have to be proud uh, about yourself. You, you have to have pride in things. And the Bible teaches the total opposite. No, we need to be humble and not proud and so uh, the world says you have to focus on your own security and of course every day we hear reports of shootings and and all kinds of dangers which are telling us it, it, it the fact that it's a dangerous world and anything can happen to you is really the point as we hear these things, at any time, at any place, you can come face to face with extreme danger that can threaten you and your family, your life, and you can die. And, of course, the, the Bible has told us that all along, that uh, it, it doesn't take someone with a gun to take our life. God can take our life any time of the day in any way in in 10,000 different ways it, it doesn't require entering into that situation where you're face to face with someone pointing a gun at you it can it can just be getting in your car and traveling and that's it you do everything right someone goes through the traffic light and you're you're gone out of this world you're dead and so what what protection can we have against death? The, that's what the world's trying to do, protect itself against death because they fear death above all. Death is their great enemy and, and they have no solution except defend yourself. Defend yourself, pick up a gun or get the best security system for your house and and do this and do that but for God's people his true elect people we know that the only solution to death is in Christ as the Lord Jesus has had mercy upon us and granted us forgiveness of sins and the gift of eternal life so that we have that security 
from the point that God has saved us where we know that if I die, I go to be with the Lord. And, and so the Bible actually says to die is gain. It, it's a positive for the one who is truly born again. We go to be with the Lord and we're in a much better place and, and then our even our dead physical body will be transformed on the last day and we'll, we'll have a, a whole new personality and we'll live forever and ever and ever. We cannot be harmed in that sense. So when we hear about dangers in the world, it's a different matter and we should not be influenced by worldly people and their fears because it's not the same thing when it comes to us. And, and so we can live in a dangerous neighborhood um, by the world standards and we can live comfortably, safely, because we know our lives are in God's hands. And, and the God who has kept us and protected us will continue to do so until he so determines not to do so, maybe physically any longer, and, and so be it. We trust in the will of God. God is our help. He is our shield. He is our protection. He is our security system. And, and he is the greatest power there can possibly be. You know, you could have a whole army. God has demonstrated this, that comes against the people of God, armed to the teeth, a whole army, and God destroys them. They wake up in the morning, and they're all dead men. That, that happened historically. And, and so if God can destroy a whole army of armed forces that come against his people, he can... He can watch out for us uh, concerning the the thief and the robber or the the um, uh, you know the uh, insane man with a weapon. He'll he'll do what he'll do, and we trust in the Lord. We trust that He will protect us and accomplish His will. And so, no, the Bible actually says that um, the one who lives by the sword dies by the sword. That's, that, that's a reference that I've always remembered that scared me as far as the idea of having a weapon in my house. Um, no thanks. No thanks. And, and we often hear of tragedies because a little child got a hold of a gun or, or something like that, and, and, and something bad has happened. So I, I prefer to just leave all that in God's hands. And, and I don't want to get into any kind of political discussion over gun rights or any of that. Uh, I'm, I'm not taking sides. I'm only saying what the Bible says. He who lives by the sword dies by the sword. And we trust God for our security. He is... He is our security and, and no weapon. Uh, but thank you for calling and sharing. And now we'll take our next caller. Welcome to our Sunday question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Yes, recently you redid like Corinthians chapter 5. And um, what I noticed is that um, you might be on the right track concerning this because I noticed from the book of Acts to Revelation that the apostles are judgmental. And in other words, like the, the man in Corinthians 5 was judged by Paul. Um, there's another place, the book of Acts, chapter 5, where Peter and John, they, ju they judged uh, Ananias and Sapphira. And in the letter of Timothy, uh, Timothy or Paul judges the women, saying, "I don't, I don't let a woman teach or usurp authority." So I think you're on the right track by interpret by interpreting the rest of the New Testament that way, because 
you know, because that, that, there's sin involved with the apostles because they were judging. They were judging people. Oh, no, and, no, um, no, no, there's no sin here. There's no sin here. Now, in 1 Corinthians 5, with the other thing you, you mentioned, um, Ananias and Sapphira, that, that was gone. Did, I know, uh, I know, but, but did, hold, hold, hold it. Did did Peter have them fall down dead? Does he have that kind of power? Who did that? That, that was God who did that. It wasn't that wasn't the apostle. God was using the apostle to highlight the fact that he's the same God yesterday, today, and forever. He's the same God of the church that he was of Israel. So. When that couple tried to deceive God, he struck them down. And we can read of God striking down people in the Old Testament, like some of the sons of Aaron, when, when they went to offer strange fire, God struck them down, same God. And, and then we read that the, the people in the church feared, and that, that was the part of the point that God was making in striking them down that he is uh, the unchangeable God um, that appeared to Moses and, and so forth in the Old Testament. Now, in 1 Corinthians 5, let's read this in verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles that one should have his father's wife. Can you imagine... The world of that time, people like to talk about the barbarians of old and, and all of the immorality they were involved with. Well, here it is reference made to the Gentiles, at least at Corinth, the people of the nations, that this would not be so much as named among the Gentiles. This kind of sin, this kind of sin is nothing in our day. And it shows that God was restraining the hearts of men, even back there in the world. And it goes on to saying, You are puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have judged already. And here the Lord is using Paul as a figure of himself. He's a, a type of God making judgment against this man who has been involved in fornication. And the man is also a figure of the corporate church. You could read Revelation 2, verses 20 and 22, which speaks of fornication as Jezebel was, in a, um, was said to be in a church. And, of course, that's another figure that God uses, and taught them to commit fornication. And so then God judges the church and says, I'll cast you into great tribulation. Well, here it's the same thing. The man's a type of the church. Paul is a type of Christ coming in spirit, uh, who's absent in body, present in spirit. I have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, and my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. So the man is delivered to Satan. And, and you can see why I said he's a type of the corporate church. Because that's exactly what God did to the church at the time of the end. He loosed Satan after the thousand years was a figurative number, and, and it ended in 1988. He loosed him, and Satan entered into the churches and congregations to rule, and God delivered up the corporate church to Satan, and that brought destruction of the flesh because we refer to those in the churches with the parabolic language of wheat and tares and and we do 
refer to them that way because that's how God referred to them in the parable of Matthew 13. We let the wheat and the tares grow together. But another way of looking at the saved and unsaved within the churches and congregations is through the language here in 1 Corinthians 5. Flesh and spirit. Those that are unsaved are in the flesh. Those that became saved within the congregations were in the spirit. And, and therefore God delivered such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. In other words, God delivered up the corporate church to Satan for judgment and its destruction, destroying the tares, destroying all the carnal-minded ones, the, the ones in the flesh, in order to save the elect, those in the spirit. And it was at that time that he commanded his people come out. And so the, the ones in the spirit left the churches and congregations only because God had delivered it up. If God didn't deliver up the flesh, they would have remained and suffered a similar fate. But since God did deliver them up and made it known, then he made the way for them to come out of the churches and congregations. And that happened in the day of the Lord Jesus as judgment began at the house of God. But thank you for calling and sharing. And now we'll go to our next caller today. Welcome wow. to our Sunday wow. question and answer program. Please go ahead with your call. Hi, Chris. Um, can you please read Matthew twelve forty six to 50? Matthew 12, starting in verse 46. Okay, it says in verse 46, while he yet talked to the people, behold, his mother and his brethren stood without, desiring to speak with him. Then one said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren stand without, desiring to speak with thee. But he answered and said unto him, that told him, Who is my mother and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand toward his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Okay, um, I was just wondering, why is Jesus' mother um, standing without? And also, why? Or I don't understand why he includes his mother in with the saved. I mean, I'm not, you know what I'm saying? Well, we, we know that Mary, his his mother, was saved, would be one reason. But are, are are you referring to like the spiritual mother, the the woman of Revelation who brought forth the man child? Well, how can we be his mother? I don't understand how we can be brothers and, and sisters and brethren, but how can the elect? Why is he saying and mother? Um, well, I don't know. It's it's just a figure that God is using. Uh, let's see. He talked yet with the people. Behold, his mother and brethren stood without, desiring desiring to speak with him. I, I I'm not sure even where he is that he is within. I'm not sure what what the emphasis would be on that. So I, I can't really, uh, you know, um, address that. Uh, but as far as the the figure we find in Revelation 12, and I know it, it, it is a figure that, that's a little difficult to kind of grab a hold of. We can understand brother and sister uh, because we're brethren, but as far as mother, it's a, a little difficult. But in Revelation 12, it says in verse 1, And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. 
And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pain to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and he sought to devour her child as soon as, as, soon as it was born. And then verse 5, And she brought forth a man child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman, see here is reference to the one who brought the man-child forth. The woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared of God that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days. And uh, that's three and a half years. It's a figure picked up in Revelation 11 verse 3 where the two witnesses prophesy for that identical period of time uh, uh, because it's looking at the New Testament age, the the New Testament church age, and, and, and so the woman has fled into the wilderness and, and that would identify with the people of God as Satan pursued them down through the centuries all throughout uh, the the church age and, and to the time of the end. Uh, so I, I'm not fully, you know, it, it's hard uh, even to uh, explain how the body of believers can be likened to the mother, but we do see in Revelation 12 that we are spiritually likened to the one who brought forth the man child and and we, we know that Christ did come down in, in the loins of, you know, Mary's descendants and so forth, but, but it was more through the promise that was carried by the people of God who were hoping, waiting on the Messiah through the word of God that, uh, that he was brought forth in fulfillment of the scripture. So that, that's as about as good as I can explain it, but thank you for calling and sharing and we don't have anyone else on the line so I think we're going to bring our question and answer program to a close at this point I would like to thank everyone for being with us and sharing your questions and comments and especially the Bible verses we had an opportunity to read and consider uh, please join us um, next Friday for for the next time we have a live question and answer program at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And may you have a good Sunday Sabbath the rest of this day. And may the Lord's perfect will be done. And thank you for joining us for eBible Fellowship's Questions and Answers Time with your host and Bible teacher, Chris McCann. You can hear these live question and answer sessions Sunday afternoons following the Sunday studies and also on Friday evenings. Check ebiblefellowship.org for the latest schedule. Until next time, may the Lord's perfect will be done.